If you don't truly understand how your brain and body work, it will be more difficult to maximize your potential. Dr. John Finn, author of the best-selling book, The Habit Mechanic, which took Dr. Finn over 20 years to write and was not intended to be read once and left on a shelf to collect dust. This book contains Dr. Finn's life's work, where he's trained and coached over 10,000 people, global businesses, high growth startups, individuals, elite athletes, coaches and teams, leading educational institutes and families to thrive and succeed in our challenging modern world. This book is exactly what I've been looking for as it's full of practical and simple exercises in each section that we can all apply for immediate results backed by science. Dr. Finn, who founded the award-winning Tougher Minds Consultancy and has three psychology-related degrees, has been working in the field of resilience, performance, and leadership science for over 20 years, and through his work has uncovered why people fail while trying their very best. For returning guests, welcome back. And for those who are new here, I'm Andrea Samadhi, author and educator with a passion for learning, understanding difficult concepts, and breaking them down so we can all use and apply the most current research to improve our productivity and results in our schools, our sports environments, and modern workplaces. On today's episode number 210, we'll explore Dr. Finn's cutting edge insights from psychology, behavioral science, neuroscience, and world champions that help organizations develop habit mechanics and chief habit mechanics. And we'll uncover the difference between the two in the interview, building resilient people, outstanding leaders and world-class teams. I've been looking for a book that bridges the science with all the strategies we've been covering on this podcast. And today we'll connect the dots with theory, practice and results as we all learn how to fine tune our brain and supercharge how we live, work, and lead. Before we meet Dr. Finn, I have to give you a bit more of his background because when reading his book, I was floored with how he connected the research to habit building with examples that we can all understand, remember, and apply. Dr. Finn and his colleagues have a collective experience of over 100 years in helping people, leaders, teams, and organizations build better habits. They've worked extensively in the highest levels of elite sport, advised the government and think tanks, had their work featured in the Sunday Times, the Sunday Telegraph, People Management, and TES published peer-reviewed papers, and popular books with the area of performance psychology, and helped tens of thousands of people to be their best more often. His company, Tougher Minds, works globally And I'll include a list of the people, teams, and organizations they've helped fulfill their potential in the show notes. Let's meet Dr. John Finn and uncover why traditional approaches to being our very best that we might all still be using are outdated and ineffective. Welcome, Dr. Finn, all the way from Leeds, United Kingdom, which I had to look up, Dr. Finn, because it's only about four hours from Worthing, Sussex, where I was actually born. Is that right? Yeah, only four hours. Well, thank you for having me, Andrea. Only four hours in the UK is quite a distance, but um, I know it's not in the States. Well, likewise, um, well, not likewise, but my great-grandfather took his family to boston um from ireland and then some of them came back and some of them stayed and i've also spent some time living in new york so and i've worked in different places in the state so yeah we've got a a sense of um how long did you stay in the uk for i was only two when i left so i remember just being on the plane coming over i think i have memories of sitting on the plane and then i had a british accent in up until first second grade in school and i wish i had it now it would be so much nicer on the podcast it's so lovely i love hearing it (laughs) no that's not the case it's good to have (laughs) contrast That's true. That's true. But anyway, Dr. Finn, I've got to tell you, I was beyond thrilled to have found your book. 
And I, I just want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast to share all these strategies with all of us. Thanks so much for being here today. Well, well done for finding it so quickly because it's only been out about two weeks. So. Wow. Wow. Your team is good because uh, they they found me. And the minute that I that I found it, we hadn't even set up the interview yet. And you could see I was reading it and just getting so excited. So this is going to be really good to dive deep into the science behind these strategies that we've all heard about. But you now prove it with this book and your experience. So that's what I think is exciting. Yes, it's exciting and it's very powerful. So I've got to tell you when I first started reading your book, because it's a, it's kind of a funny story. I was going in for a routine medical procedure and it was nothing serious, but I had an IV in my right arm and I'm holding my cell phone and I do all my reading on my Kindle on my phone. And uh, so I was jotting down notes and getting really excited. And they were like, you've got to go in in the next 15 minutes. I'm like, no, I've got to figure out what what was the secret behind Roger Bannister's success. I'm like, don't take me, take someone else first. And then when I woke up, I remember telling the doctor how profound your book was. So I'm not sure if he uh, purchased the book, but I'm sure everyone in the room um, that was waiting to go in, I'm sure they all clicked on and found it on, on Amazon. So I hope I created some buzz for you after my review. You ended up, you ended up changing more people's lives in the hospital than... <laughs> the other way around. Well, that's what that's what a book can do. And so anyway, it was those first few pages that really blew me away. But can you explain where this started for you, how you used failure as a catalyst with your story and how you noticed that mental skills were more important than physical skills launching your career into performance psychology? Yes, I think that if you want to be very good at something and you want to push yourself, like I know many of your listeners do, the mental skills are more important because if you want to get really good at something, it's about deliberate practice, that practice where you're on the edge and you're making mistakes and you're pushing yourself. We know the importance of being resilient and mentally tough. And the story that I use in the book was one of me playing a selection match for an international student rugby game which was, I was about 19 years old and it was the most important rugby match I'd ever played in. And I was the full back, which means you have to catch a lot of high balls. And it was a wet, windy, horrible day in the North of England. And we were playing against a, a men's professional team and the ball went up and I had to catch it. And the only thing I could think about was don't drop it, don't mess it up you're going to get flattened if someone's going to hit you really hard. And I mean, I didn't even drop the ball. I just completely missed it. And they scored a try. I got substituted. But the, the perverse thing was I was studying sports psychology at the time. So it made me really think, wait a minute, you're supposed to be studying these ideas and you really need to start, you know, putting more of them into practice. And I think the whole, well, the whole philosophy of, the habit mechanic is that it's not about being perfect. It's about getting better at stepping back, reflecting, doing what we call intelligent self-watching and just continually working on yourself so that, you know, life's a journey of ups and downs. And if you take this approach, when you're on an up, you'll be more aware of where you actually are and do you need to push yourself further or do you need to take your foot off the gas a little bit? But when you're going on a down, you'll be able to stop yourself falling faster than you may otherwise have done. But this all comes back to what we might call mental skills and you know how, how we think. Oh, it's so true. And, and as we get into this, you're gonna show us how we make those mental skills automatic, right? Because you didn't have time to, the ball's coming. You just went with what automatically happened. So there's a little bit be more behind how we do that than just becoming a habit mechanic and having these skills, right? How, how do we got to do yeah. some stuff behind this practice? Most of education is based on knowing things. And if we just take a really simple example, so here in the UK, we have the National Health Service, the NHS, which is actually the biggest company in Europe. It's huge, huge, huge budget. And it's done a great job at educating people in the UK that they need to walk 10,000 steps a day. 
and that they need to eat five portions of fruit and veg a day. And most people, well, more people than ever know that advice. And most people agree that's a good idea to do. Yet some data came out last week or the week before showing that currently the NHS is spending half of its budget on lifestyle related diseases. These are diseases that emerge because people do not eat five portions of fruit and veg a day and they do not walk 10,000 steps. And it's not because they don't know what to do or it's not because they don't even agree with the advice. Knowing is very different from doing. And in fact, doing is different from habit because to get habit, it's a thing that you do repeatedly. So really, I think we need to get away from just helping people to know what they need to do, like thinking clearly and calmly under the high ball or, or whatever situation you're in and help them to build better habits. And if you want to use the science terminology here, what I've learned over the last 20 plus years with my three uh, degrees of psychology related fields, including a PhD is that implicit emotional regulation seems to be the holy grail of making it easier for us to be at our best. That means we can turn regulating our emotions into a habit, if you like, into something that's semi-automatic or more automatic. So yeah, it's not just about knowing, we've got to help people to do it. And we can use insights from neuroscience, behavioral science, leadership science to make it easier for people to actually do the things and build habits of those things that, that we all know is a good idea to do. Right. And, and what I found was so powerful with this is that this is the field I've been immersed in really since the late 90s, since I worked with this motivational speaker and saw the importance of working with kids with these ideas. So you're talking to somebody that's been doing a lot of these things and looking at your book, I thought I could really improve in this area because of your analogy. So what, what I found to be so phenomenal about it was that it showed me where my holes were as a habit builder, as a serious habit builder. And I thought, oh my goodness, you know, th this is a powerful book to really start to, um, to fine tune. That's why you say you're going to supercharge for our brain, right? We're all going to see where we can improve because we're not all perfect. Yeah. So what you're describing is really the essence of the first part of the book, which is about developing habit mechanic intelligence. So this intelligence about ourselves, knowing ourselves better, but in a really pragmatic way that makes it easier for us to be healthy, happy, and at our best. And we use a, an igloo, which we're going to talk about later on, I think, analogy to help us to think about that so that we see ourselves building up our habit mechanic intelligence and the reality is, is the world we live in has never been designed in a, in a further away um, design. I can't think of a better way to say that at this point, but it's never been designed in a more unhelpful way to compare to what we are designed to do. So it feels like every day the world is, is, is moving further and further away from what we are designed to do. I'm currently stood on a, you know, on a walking treadmill, oh, wow. a workstation treadmill. Um, you can get a bit of sound effect there. I don't know if that comes through. Yeah. So I can start to walk now. But anyway, the, the reason I'm saying this is that, apart from to show off, is 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 that um, we're designed to walk about 12 miles a day, you know, neurobiologically. Yeah, our jobs now are all sedentary and through the pandemic period, you know, many people weren't even leaving their house for never mind one day, you know, sometimes for weeks at a time. So the world is more challenging than ever before. And the need, therefore, to develop your habit mechanic intelligence is more important than ever before. So the for our maybe our grandparents generations and even our parents generations where we have much more of this factory model of work where you learned your job at quite a young age and you could keep doing the same job, you know, until you retired, you didn't have to learn too much new professionally. That doesn't exist anymore. We now live in the VUCA world where the only constant is change and you might have the perfect skills for your job today, but the reality is there won't be the perfect skills for your job in six months time because the tech will have changed. The demands will have changed. The rules will have changed. And the backdrop to that is it's getting harder and harder to manage ourselves. 
because again our brains are designed for survival not to do the things that we, we that, that are demanded of us every single day so i don't know if i've gone down a rabbit hole there andrea but just no, hopefully no this is all it's all relevant because it is a broad topic and so i'm just kind of trying we'll we'll narrow in as we get into it um, but the, the biggest thing that I noticed was that we all need this. It doesn't matter if you've been working on your habits. I just interviewed Greg Link, uh, who partnered with Dr. Stephen Covey for the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And he talked about how they took that book global and the habits and everything. And we really dove deep into it. And just from reading just from that interview i thought we still have so much more that we can narrow in on that that you're going to go into but i just wonder because these are proprietary secrets that you've uncovered from working with all of the the sports teams that you've worked with why did you decide to share it with the world in this book well my mission in life is to help people to do better um I'm not giving people a license to rip off our intellectual property when I say that, but we've just worked really hard to get the program to a place. And this book is a manual. It's not like a, a book with one idea repeated 10 times. This is a manual for life. And we got the program to a point where it just works and helps people to do better. So we wanted to get it out there into the, into the public. Um, but I also know that knowing this isn't enough is that people are still going to need help for implementation. Um, and we, we can offer that support as well. And as you said, Andrea, whoever you are, whether you're a, a school children, and we have programs, you know, in schools um, where children get taught these lessons every, every, every week and they have our planners and they're using them on a daily basis. We teach their parents it, we teach their teachers it, or whether you're running a global business as a CEO, or whether you're running an elite sports team or you're an elite athlete, these fundamental ideas are more important than ever before and no one teaches them to you. I think I, the, I've seen in my career when I worked in professional sports, sports science was first being um, adopted by teams and you saw steadily you'd go from one strength and, strength and conditioning coach to all of a sudden there'd be a full team of them and one analyst to then as a whole team of analysts, one nutritionist, an entire team, whereas psychology stayed really static. And I think because it's in, in the sense of they weren't employing more psychologists. In fact, they were sometimes, you know, going from one to none, because I think it's such an intangible area. And this thing that drives our behavior, our brain is invisible to us. It's encased inside a skull. We don't see it. You can see the muscle on your arm. You can see the food you put inside your body. You can see your physical actions on the sports field, but the brain is invisible yet. It's driving everything that we do. And it's only until, you know, quite recently, we've even been able to see our brain in real time when we got, when functional MRI scanners became cheap enough to actually allow us to see inside our brain. And if we went back in a time machine 20 years and we spoke to the top neuroscientists in the world, it turns out their understanding of the of the brain wasn't all that well developed because they would tell us that when you stopped physically growing your brain stops changing in any significant way and we know that that now is simply not true so we've had these very fantastic insights from neuroscience and behavioral science about what we're designed to do what makes it easier for us to do certain things but it's been quite complex to take them from the scientific literature and actually make them readily available so people can use them. But people can use them to do better. So for me, why not share that? Why not share that with people and help everyone to do better? Wonderful. Well, when I told you when I was first reading it, what stuck out to me was the very beginning when you reveal in step one, discovering your superpower all about Roger Bannister. And we know that he was the first person to break the record for the four minute mile. Uh, the speaker I worked for all the time used to talk about it, like the mental thing of knowing, OK, I'm going to I can do what's never been done before and do where others had failed. But what did he have to learn to make his training more efficient and effective than his competitors that you discovered? Yeah, and it, 
I did discover this and I was thinking in my head, imagine if Roger Bannister had been doing research on, you know, physiology and it turned out he had been when I dug into it. So Roger Bannister was not only the first person to run the sub four minute mile, uh, he also, if that wasn't enough, he was also training to be a medical doctor at Oxford University and he was also a research scholar. So he was doing laboratory research on the role of oxygen on physical performance. So this was sort of early sports science research as we think about it. Now you see people on the treadmill, they've got a, a mask on that's uh, measuring gas exchange, etc. So he was doing that work in the 1940s. And that work led him to understand the essential role that oxygen played in running performance, which might seem pretty no brainer now, but that was new insight back then. And that led him to understand that actually, if he was going to uh, run faster, he had to get better at conserving how he used oxygen. And therefore he developed a different running style, essentially, that was more efficient and effective. So he drilled that style through the way that he practiced so he could turn it into a habit. That's why we say Roger Bannister is a habit mechanic. And then it paid dividend um, when he actually broke broke the time because he wasn't the only person trying to do it, you know. There were other very serious people trying to do it as well. But he got the advantage because he was looking at it through a, a scientific lens and the other the other people weren't. Now this is amazing because it's difficult to change your breathing. So what he did was very hard to change your breathing is a very difficult thing. So what he did wasn't easy, but it made the difference, right? Yeah, it wasn't common sense at the time. Mm. It was way ahead of its time. You know, and if you look at some of the things he was doing, you could argue that professional sports only caught up with some of those ideas, very what I'd call functional equivalent practice, practicing exactly how you're going to perform. They've only caught up in the last, you know, 20, 20 years or so as sports science has, has, has come in. So yeah, fascinating. So Roger, uh, Roger Bannister is the original habit mechanic. Wow. I love it. I love that. And then as I was thinking about this, I thought, what about a sports team? Because we've got an individual here with Roger and having him change one thing, his breathing is much different than having a team change something. So then I saw that you worked with the head coaches of the rugby league, super league, and I couldn't miss asking what science-based advice would you offer to a head coach of a sports team to create a championship team? Yeah. So you can think about this in a few ways. The basics are you need to create a culture where everyone's brain is working well. That's the basis. Because if your brain's not working properly, you're going to be on threat detection. You're not going to be able to learn and develop yourself like you might need to. You're not going to be able to perform under pressure as well as you, as well as you might want to. So the basics is getting everyone's brains working. Then you've got to make it okay to share that vulnerability so that it's okay to be working on yourself and to be getting better and to be coming in and wanting to improve every day. And then you've got to connect that self-improvement, that collective improvement to a big mission that everyone can buy into and everyone can get behind. And a, a metaphor that we use to help um, teams, whether you're you know, business or sport, to think about this is you're climbing a mountain. And there's an old metaphor of leadership of you know, the, you're driving the bus and you need to get everyone onto the bus. And that's the key thing. But for me, that metaphor is dead. That way of explaining leadership is dead because that implies that it's about one titled leader who's in charge, who's driving everything. It implies that the road is clear ahead, that you know where you're going. The VUCA world has changed the rules where the only constant is change. So I think the better metaphor now is that everyone is on a snowmobile going up the mountain in stormy conditions and it's the leader's job to coordinate the snowmobiles and to you know, help everyone to be at their best. So the way that on a high level we think about this is that you can think of helping a team to be at its best in three simple steps. First of all, you've got to help everyone to learn how to drive their snowmobile. And most people who listen to this have learned how to drive. So that takes time, right? 
it's not you're not going to do it in a webinar or a workshop you're going to have to do it over a period of time so you've got to train your people to learn how to control their snowmobiles i would call that you've got to train them to become habit mechanics and that's going to take time and how to do that is in the book that's the, the first part of the book the second thing then is you've got to pack your team full of driving instructors some are informal like parental driving instructors that give you verbal support and encouragement and they can take you for a free driving lesson in the supermarket car park at the weekend but also you need lots of formal driving instructors in there as well who really understand how to help other people to develop better habits so they can really use their snowmobiles and then finally what you need is, is the c-suite and the senior leaders they are like the department for transport they've got to create the highway code that makes it really easy for people to be well and to perform to their potential you know and to use their their snowmobile safely but also you know max max them out in a safe way so the department for transport in the uk its job is to help people to drive safely so whatever your mission is in your organization you've got to create the highway code to help people to get up the mountain to achieve the mission and whatever your highway code looked like before the pandemic it needs to be different now because hybrid work has different rules and if you don't think you have a highway code i guarantee you you have one it's just invisible and it's driving everything that everybody's doing every single day so to make that tangible how do you activate that it, the the final part of the book step four is learning to be a chief habit mechanic and one of the tools we have in there is the the team power builder so it takes you through five different stages as you work through the mountain and you can use those stages to help the team evaluate and assess itself so to get that intelligent group self-watching and helping everyone to be a better habit mechanic and also helping everyone to be a better a team power leader so at a high level that's how i would think about it don't know if that helps it's it seems so much more complex for helping a team to become a champion than in, than an individual like it, just one person they can measure like roger did and and figure out how he's going to improve that one thing to take him to new heights but as a sports team you've got to get every single player going up that mountain who's in who's in charge of it would it be the leader to make sure everyone does what they need to do or are there many different pieces that you see yeah well i think the, su the surprising truth is that everyone's in charge because leadership just means influence and everybody's got influence some people have a big positive influence some people have a big negative influence some people have a tiny positive influence others have a tiny negative influence just the rule of the eyes influences other people's behavior you know a sneaky comment the way your body language isn't quite right so everyone has responsibility and that's why we want everyone to be a better team power leader um so it's about recognizing that actually everyone has leadership responsibility but you've got big leaders and you've got little leaders but you can use leadership science which is something that I've not heard anyone else use that term but it's something where we talk about in the book you can actually use leadership science which is a combination of neuroscience behavioral science and applied psychology to make it easier to create that culture to make it easy for everyone to be at their best and what I think what's really important is that exactly as you're saying if you want to be a great leader you've got to start by becoming a great habit me habit mechanic yourself and the way we've created the habit mechanic approach is that you can use exactly the same tools that you help yourself to be at your best to help others to be at their best it's the same science it's the same insights but you've got to start with you being at your best and that's often where we get leadership training wrong is we think how do we help them to help everybody else we actually we need to start with how do we help them how do we how can we help them to help themselves first of all and not just so they know what they should be doing but to build better leadership habits. Definitely. And it makes me think about uh, 
teachers in the classroom. I do a lot of work with educators and we sometimes think that, you know, when your students are going off track, like what's wrong with them? And it all starts with, with us. That was a big lesson I learned um, along the way here is that, you know, when we are regulated ourselves, then we co-regulate others. And it's important to start with us before we can lead in a classroom or in any way. Managing our own emotions is is gonna yeah be helpful for setting that emotional ter- tone and um, going down that discipline route of being angry and, and being aggressive just shuts everyone's brain down. It doesn't mean you can never say anything negative to anyone, but if you understand how brains work, you'll be able to do that much more efficiently and effectively. Um, you know, part of the reason that hybrid work is more challenging is because our number one technology for communicating and collaborating as a team, which is the the most important thing we can do in the VUCA world to help us to solve all these problems that are coming our way, are called mirror neurons. And mirror neurons just do not work as well when we are communicating over video conferencing, over email, over the telephone, because they're in-person technologies mirror neurons help us to read each other's emotions so we don't need to open our mouths or someone else to open their mouth to understand how they're feeling we can see it on their face so yeah the more we can help anyone who's trying to help other people whether it's teachers coaches managers to understand how their own brain works and therefore how other people's brain works and the the better equipped they're going to be to actually do their job really well Definitely. Well, I love all of this. This is this is good. And this brings us to the fact that you talk about how uh, there's superpowers that we have. And I've always felt this, that we're always really good at something and we kind of know what that is. And it's the key to unlocking our potential when we figure out what it is and we learn how to use it. And then science shows that with this deliberate and focused practice, we can improve anything. So what, whatever it is that we need to improve, we can, with deliberate practice, get better at it. But can you explain how we learn a new skill and turn it into a habit with your analogy of the ice cube? Because I thought this is going to really help us make this habit building stick. So walk us through that bit. Yeah, so... Uh- what we're saying is that learning is the foundational superpower because you can learn to get better at anything because your brain is like plasticine and it changes depending on what you pay attention to. And that's the first step to learning anything. It's paying attention. So you pay attention to something that goes into your short-term memory for about 30 seconds and you can hold five to seven bits of information in there. So imagine you just met a group of uh, 10 people you can't remember all of their names. If I And if I say just now some numbers, 33, 21, 27, 2, 8, 103, 1,027, 2,009, 93, 73, already I've overloaded your working yeah. short-term memory, right? You can't hold that information. So you pay attention, you get into your short-term memory, but it's only going to be there for a very short period of time. So in order to move into your long-term memory, you've got to use it. You've got to repeat it, essentially. So R to R, repeat to remember, remember to repeat. When you start to repeat that thing, you move it from, think of like a a cobweb-like connection into a cable-like connection. And the way that we strengthen those neurological connections is through moving from knowing something to practicing it. So I might know how to... um, have a really good rapport building 10 minutes with my coachee that I'm working with. I might know exactly how to do that, but knowing how to do it is very different from doing it. So to strengthen my connections there, I need to practice doing it. And the more I practice doing that, moving from the knowing to the doing, I'll start to habitualize some of the way that I communicate with my coachees. So it's almost like you're moving from vapor that's in the ether that you pay attention to and you get it into your head and you, the more you practice that thing, it's like you freeze it into an ice cube. So you move the, the knowledge into something really tangible in your brain, which are, which are neurobiological connections. But if you think of it as an ice cube, you freeze the ice cube. And the thing is, is that when you stop practicing that skill, the ice cube melts 
So you will forget to, to ride a bike if you don't practice riding a bike, you know. And we don't just practice by doing, we practice by observing and all this kind of stuff. But um, we're learning all the time. So if you think of the people that you went to primary school with or elementary school, at the time you knew everyone's name in your class. So you had neurons for everyone's name. But now I bet you don't remember everybody's name because the neurons that you had for some people's names have died because you don't use them anymore. They've pruned away. And this is absolutely fundamental understanding how learning happens for anyone who's trying to help people to do better because that's about helping them to learn to do something differently. And yet I know here in the UK, I don't think we teach our teachers the fundamentals of, of learning, you know, which seems so bizarre because that's the currency that they're operating in. And once you understand it, it's going to supercharge your ability to help people do it. Absolutely. I loved that when I saw it because, you know, we've heard, you know, use it or lose it and neurons that fire together, wire together and neurons that are out of sync fail to link. But to me, that just put everything in, in the brain still. You've taken an ice cube and you and how you explained it from the ether. You don't have the skill it's in the ether and then it gets stronger and it gets bigger until it's a solid bit of ice. I just loved it. And then we're going to go a little bit deeper here, but I just want to talk about the fact that uh, we have covered building habits like this on past episodes. Ha episode 103, we talked about how to set goals in different areas of your life. But after reading this part of the habit building, where you talked about the ice cube to the igloo, can you talk about um, maybe some mistakes that you see that are common as to why habit or skill building doesn't stick, build into this ice cube and what we've got to do to make them stick and build into the igloo or whatever it is that we're building in the future? Yeah, so maybe it's helpful just to speak about the, the, the igloo idea. So the idea is that you have almost like a housing estate of igloos in your life. Each igloo represents important areas of your life. So you might have one for parenting, one for work performance, one for learning a new language, one for doing your MBA, one for your coaching, one for your habit, being a habit mechanic, whatever, whatever they are. And these different igloos are in different states of repair. Some are looking great, some will need a lot of work, but all of them will have at least some chunks of ice in. And in order to build them up, it's about doing more learning on the next uh, ice cube that you need to freeze so for example if i want to be a better habit mechanic i might have identified i might identify i need to get better at managing stress so one of the ice cubes i want to freeze is getting better at doing um ex expressive writing that's something i need to get better at because that's a good uh, stress management tool so that's the that's moving from the ice cube to the igloo why do people fail to build better habits? I think fundamentally because we don't think about it through a systematic behavioral science lens. We have lots of tricks and lots of tactics, but they're not drawing on um, first principles of why we do what we do. And that's what behavioral science helps us to unlock. The complexity of behavioral sciences, we have lots of great academics working on different parts of behavioral science all championing their own area of expertise and saying this is the most important bit because they're not incentivized to glue all the bits together and make them practical so people can use them. That's not their job. Their job is to dig deeper into the, the bits they're researching. So that's what we've spent a lot of time doing is gluing all those bits together and creating what we call a nine action factors model, which is central for the book. And we use the nine action factors model to help people to build habit plans. So I think one good example we could use to get people thinking about what they need to do to learn something is a driving example. Because driving is a complex behavior and a lot of the things that we want to learn to help ourselves to feel better and do better and help others do better are also complex behaviors like sleeping better, managing stress, being more productive, performing under pressure being an outstanding leader, they're all complex behaviors. So they take time to learn, you know, they're complex. So driving, you don't do it in one lesson, you do it over a, 
on average 65 hours over maybe six months. So the first thing that we need to, that we can glean from learning to drive is that we accept, although we, we might know what we need to do, we're only going to progress our skills one tiny step at a time. So you will see someone like BJ Fogg's work, you know, this idea of tiny habits. So people, when you're learning to drive, you accept you're going to do it in tiny steps. After the first lesson, you just probably not, might not even drive anyway, just work out what everything is. Yeah, when you're trying to lose weight, if you haven't done it after the first week, you beat up, you beat yourself up and you give up. Or if you're trying to build better sleep habits, if you haven't done it after day one, you create a narrative that you'll never be able to do and it's just because you're a bad sleeper. So we first of all have to accept we can make change, absolutely, but we do it in tiny steps. The second thing to think about is that if you learned how to drive, there was a reason I had to get the kids to school. I had to get to work. I wanted to be the first person in my peer group to do it. So if you can connect this thing that you're trying to change today to a, a bigger, more meaningful goal, that's going to make it easier to keep persisting with the change you're trying to make. And we have some tools in the book that help you to do that, like the fam story too. Next thing we have to recognize is that, um, and, and by the way, if you want to build habits for watching more Netflix or eating more donuts, you don't have to worry too much about the behavioral science because it's already on your side because they're simple behaviors. But the next thing for, you, you may have accepted, well, it's about tiny changes and it's about, I can connect it to big meaningful goals, so I'm motivated. But you, you're going to have to learn some new knowledge and skills. That's why you have driving lessons. And again, if you want to get better at managing stress or building better sleep habits or becoming a better leader, you're going to have to learn some new knowledge and skills which for becoming a habit mechanic, they're all in the book. The, sec the next thing is, it's really helpful if you're learning to drive, if your parents know how to do it, because they can give you some advice. They can take you for free driving lessons at the weekend. So if you want to build a new habit, it's really helpful if people in your community already understand how to do it. And that's why we've created this habit mechanic language. So you can share very complex ideas which might be about learning that we've just been talking about in a really simple but scientifically grounded way. So we create this language across our community that can help us all to do better. The next thing is, if I want to be a good driver, but my father doesn't think the speed limit is a valid idea or my mother doesn't believe in car insurance, they're not going to be great role models for me learning to be a good driver. So whatever habits we're trying to build, we have to recognize the role of social influence has on our daily behaviors and what we do. The next thing to pay attention to are reward and penalty systems. So governments have worked out that they need to incentivize good driving behavior and penalize bad driving behavior. So if you drive well, you get your license, your car insurance goes down, you're a good, responsible citizen, et cetera. If you drive poorly, you might never get your license, but if you do, then you'll get monetary fines, you'll get points on your license, eventually you'll, you'll lose your license. So you have to think about what are the reward and penalty systems that are driving my current behavior and how do I tweak those systems? And we show you how to do that in the book. Then you've got what we call external triggers. So when you're driving, because government's not, it's a habit, you are constantly reminded what to do. There's a ping, ping, ping if you don't put your seatbelt on. There's a speedometer. There's a line in the middle of the road to remind you which side of the road to drive on. There are speed cameras and crossing signs and police cars, all, rem all to remind you to drive safely. So again, when we're trying to build a new habit, we've got to work out how do we, how do we manage the external triggers to make it easier for us to do the thing that we want to do. And then finally, we've got to consider what we call brain states. So if you try to learn to drive when you're sleep deprived, it will be a lot less efficient and effective than if you do it when you're really mentally fresh. So we've got to make sure that when we're trying to learn to do diff diff difficult things that we plan to do it when we are uh, mentally sharp. And we can take all those insights 
and we can use them to build habit building plans and it, it's, that's done for you in the book that's what we do in our programs and it's not about creating a perfect habit building plan it's about learning how to get better and better at changing your behavior in a systematic way and because you're doing it from a scientific basis you can keep going back to the science and this is about building up our habit mechanic intelligence so has that answered the question andrea it has and so i want to go back for a second and just recap so we've got the ice cube analogy where we're building a strong habit then we take it to the igloo which you know if we're going to implement this then we're going to think about what are all the pieces or habits that we want to build and we've got to know that and if I think about all the training I've had over the years and, and all the work that I've done, usually this type of work happens at the end of the year. You're like, what am I going to improve on next year? And you create your plans and you think, for me, I pick four areas of my life that I'm going to really focus on. Those are my little bricks of the igloo. And you know, if, if you're a sports team, you're going to pick all your skills, right? Or whatever your gaps are to put into your igloo. Is that how, how do you know or, or identify your bits on your igloo and then how do you know or how do you make sure that you are practicing those or implementing that it doesn't just get written down and left off for, for me I read everything every morning I wake up and I what what am I doing towards these four things I'm working on but how do we make sure do you have trackers or something like that to make sure that we're doing the things we say we're going to do no, so a tracker might be, well, behaviorally, behavioral science wise, a tracker is an external trigger. It's also a reward and penalty system. So these factors work together. But at a very high level, what we're trying to do is more intelligent self watching. We're not very good at self watching as human beings. We're not designed to do it. We're designed to be focused on the external world. If we were designed to be focused on what's going on inside our heads, we wouldn't be able to think about anything else because it's pretty complex. But we need to get better at doing intelligent self-watching. And the Habit Mechanic book shows you how to do that. But then we also need to get better at intelligent planning. And intelligent planning is using behavioral science and using things like the habit building um, plans to help you to do that. And in, that's you've referred to this in passing, but... In the book, there are over 30 habit mechanic and chief habit mechanic tools. So all these, this might sound a little bit intangible, but in the book, they're, they're, they're breaking down into very tangible tools. And for everything, every habit you want to build, there's a, a set of tools you can use to help you to do intelligent um, self-watching and intelligent planning. If you go back to the igloo idea, I would just say to people, write down, what are your top five roles and responsibilities in work and life? Mm -hmm. Parent, maybe, could be a couple of technical roles at work. I'm a leader. Um, I want to improve my golf. Whatever, just get it down on paper. Mm -hmm. Then rate out of 10, 10 being that I am perfect in these areas, rate out of 10 where you think you currently are. Mm -hmm. 10 would mean I'm perfect. One would mean I'm useless. Just give yourself a score. And then pick the area that you want to work on that you think is most beneficial for you to work on. And just start to write out what are the important components for you performing well in this area. So as a parent, what is it? What are the important things? What are you good at? What have you got? And then what would you like to get a bit better at? So by writing it down, we're doing more intelligent self-watching. Right. And then what we need to do is, as, you're, as you said, is you focus in on one area and you create a plan to help you to improve that area. So one of the tool, one of the confidence building tools we have is called Cozy Confidence, where and the example we use in the book is um, Jessica Ennis Hill, who's a world champion heptathlete. And she had a very bad uh, injury to her left leg that she had to rehabilitate from. So we, we use that example of Jess working on her left leg long jump. So COSI stands for knowledge, others, skills, and you. So for her to, to essentially freeze an ice cube for learning how to jump off her left leg 
in the long jump as opposed to what she'd been practicing all, all, all her life, a right leg jump. She could get some more knowledge about how to do it. So she could watch some video footage of what does it look like when you plant your foot, et cetera. What's the technique like? She could get some support from others. She could get some technical support from a coach and some emotional support from a coach. She could get some emotional support from a family. But she's got to also implement the skill. So watching herself do it or watching it on a video is one thing, but practicing doing it in real time is another thing. So you've got to implement the skill. And that's often where we might fall down because we're not implementing what we know in what, what we know we should do. And then the why stands for you. So these are you strengths. We've all got these transferable strengths. Could be I'm resilient, could be I'm patient, could be I'm a hard worker, could be I'm persistent. And whatever area in our life we want to get better at, we can bring those transferable skills with us. So whichever igloo you want to build, you've already got some chunks of ice because you've got those transferable use skills. And if you can read and you can write, then you've got some other chunks of ice because they're also essential for learning anything new. Does that answer the question? Yeah. And, and then what I, what I was thinking about, especially when I'm sitting there, like I was when I was reading your book to start with, I don't like those times of the day where we waste time. I like everything to be scheduled. And, and then I saw your analogy of the barcode with the time. And I loved that because th this really made me think about, well, what are the activities that I put into my day and, you know, how could I improve that? And it's very visual on this barcode analogy that you've got. And I'm always trying to cheat the system. Like we've all, we've all got 24 hours in the day, but I'm like, how could I get more time, more, more productive barcodes in there? Can you explain this barcode analogy, maybe where it came from and how to identify our super habits versus destructive habits so we can improve productivity with this analogy? Yeah, so there are only 24 hours in a day. That's all you've got. And broadly speaking, you can either be doing and thinking things that are helpful for you being at your best, being healthy, happy at your best, or you can be doing and thinking things that are unhelpful for you being uh, happy and at your best. So you could spend 24 hours sleeping. That would be helpful for a bit, but unhelpful for some of the other time. You could spend no time sleeping that would be, you know, un unhelpful for some of the time. So it's about striking this balance. And we talk about brain states in the productivity chapter and in the activation chapter, but it's just giving the people a real simple visual way to think about their lives. And I think what's really important about our approach is it's not prescriptive. It's absolutely flexible. It's just saying, here's how your brain works. Here's the gist. Here are a range of tools. You use the tools, test them out, try them out to see what works best for you. So the barcode looks different for everybody, but it's just a simple way of helping people to visualize, you know, what's going on for them. And then the second question, I've forgotten, Andrea, so you're gonna have to remind oh, no, me. Th that's okay. So, so then if we take this analogy, cause I always like to do what you're saying in the book. So how could I improve my productivity? Should I write in there? Is like the white space my productive? How, how do we actually use this to maybe look at it and say, oh, wow, I'm spending too much time on this. It's just another way of looking at productive and destructive, right? Oh, yeah. So super habits and destructive habits. Well, to extend, you know, a, a white line in, in the book could be sleeping, could be relaxing, could be going for a run. And just very, very quickly, let me explain our brain battery analogy. So imagine your brain is like a battery and it has three charge states. It has a recharge state, which can be sleeping or non-sleeping. It has a medium charge state, which you can use to do sort of mindless, busy work. And it has a high charge state, which you used to do really focused, clever work. You've got to get a balance of those three brain states in every, any 24 hour period. And for me personally, I need to be spending 11 to 12 hours in any 24 hour period doing recharge work. I can spend seven to eight hours doing medium charge work, but I've only got four or five hours a day. I can do really high charge focus work. And that's all that we've got because uh, that high charge work is a scarce cognitive resource. 
So you've got to use those insights to work out what your optimal um, barcode looks like. But we have another tool in the book called the activation profile, which also helps you to understand that. But I think to speak to super habits and destructive habits, what I've learned on my journey, helping myself and helping others is that some habits are disproportionately helpful. Some habits are disproportionately unhelpful. So I call the habits that are disproportionately helpful super habits. And I call the habits that are disproportionately unhelpful destructive habits. So one habit can activate loads of other helpful behavior. Equally, one habit can activate loads of other unhelpful behavior. So a super habit for me, I, I've worked out because I want to do my high charge work in the morning and get my activation to the right level, which is another content we talk about in the book. I go for a run every workday morning. I go for a run so I can get the right neurotransmitters into my brain. So when I sit at my desk, I can do the clever focus work. That means I'm more productive in the day. It means I feel better about myself. It means it's easier to eat the right things. It means I finish work on time. It means I'm going to sleep better that night. So you see, just by doing that one thing, it activates lots of other helpful behavior. A destructive habit example might be eating too late. Because when I eat too late, I eat too much. I don't sleep very well. I feel groggy the next day. I'm less productive. I end up eating late again that night. See, it triggers all these other helpful behaviors. And we only learn about this by developing a habit mechanic intelligence. So as you work through the book, you work through the habit mechanic program, you'll learn about your, you'll start to uncover your super habits and your destructive habits. This is a continual life journey. I'm still on this journey. You know, I'm learning about myself every day. And you can also work out what are your leadership super habits, what are your leadership destructive habits, what are your team super habits, what are your team destructive habits. So that, that's how all that fits together. Got it. This, that was really helpful because I like to see things right in front of me and have them written down and do things when when I'm reading, how to implement and and that I thought was a really powerful way to just look at what's a super habit moving me forward and what's holding me back, just a different way of looking at it, which I really liked. Another powerful analogy to help us move past our obstacles and actually achieve what we're writing down and bring them into our goals. Can you explain your lighthouse brain model in step two of the habit mechanic so we can be better at managing the stressors that come our way and knock us off, off our course? Yeah, so I wanted to create a really simple way to help people to understand how their brain works at a gist level. Um, you know, building on the foundations of Paul McLean's True Night Brain Model where we didn't have the technology to look inside the brain and he managed to get, you know, do a reasonable job of working out uh, what the different parts are doing. But so I've, I've created, in the book, we have three brain models, a uh, range and in sophistication. So the final one is actually, this is how what's happening in your brain. But the most basic model is a lighthouse brain model. So imagine you have a lighthouse in your brain. Two characters live there. One is called Hugh, which stands for horribly unhelpful emotions. Hugh operates the searchlight of the lighthouse and it's scanning all the time. The other character is called Wilhelmina Power or Willpower. You can decide which one it is for you. And Willpower lives in the, the lighthouse's training room and it's learning how to help you to be at your best. And its job is to coach you and mentor you and help you to get better at managing its unhelpful impulses, both for threat detection, short-term gratification. But if we go back to Hugh, Hugh is scanning your thoughts, your memories, and it's looking at the past, the present, and the future. And its first instinct is to look for problems and threats and worries. That's what it's looking for. That's what it's designed to do. And when there's not an obvious problem, threat, or worry, and that you know it's project it's, it's projecting those into the future so if you if you're worried about your time management and you maybe you're going to miss the train or something it's thinking 10 steps down the head road and it's already beating you up for something that hasn't even happened and probably will never happen but that's its job when there are no obvious threats in the past the present or the future it's looking for 
short-term gratification. It's looking to do things that are really easy that give you a, a big reward. But when it spots a, a problem or a threat, it can send a message up to willpower. Say, willpower, we've got a problem. And that's when we become consciously aware of the problem. And when your brain's working well, willpower goes down and it helps you to reinterpret the problem or to properly interpret the problem and work out, is this a real problem? Is it just imaginary? Do I need to calm you down? Do we need to work on a plan together to actually overcome this problem? So you've got to get those two characters working together. That's harder than ever before because of the conditions of the world we live in. But essentially, the book, the Have Mechanic Approach, is helping you to build, to, to get willpower trained up so it can help Hugh. And what you're trying to do when your willpower helps you is you're trying to rewire and reprogram you. So it does more of that helpful reprocessing itself, which in neuroscience is called implicit emotional regulation. So you've got all these bits working together. As we're building on each question, I can see how we become a habit builder with the ice cube, building it into an igloo, learning to regulate, building our strengths. And then can you take us to now the nine action factors? You've mentioned it a little bit, but is there a fancy way to turn on and off these switches that are our action factors to be sure that we actually do these things that you've suggested in the habit mechanics? Yeah, so that's what the habit building plan does. So when I gave the driving example of when you learn to drive, I was talking through the nine action factors. What the habit building plan allows you to do is deliberately switch them on. So plan to use them. So if we take, a, I'll just open the book here because I can talk you through one of the examples. So if we take a sleep example, this I'll talk you through a habit building plan. So the, the first thing you need to do is make sure that you're working. So I, I might say, I want to improve my sleep. I want to get better at sleeping. You've got to make that into a tiny little goal. So instead of saying, I want to get better at sleep, and that's too vague to be helpful, you need to say something like, I want to get 10 minutes more sleep tonight than last night. That's my aim. Start with one minute. I want to get one minute more sleep tonight than last night. Then you can think about what you currently do instead of that behavior. So what's the competing behavior? I stay up and I watch TV. I keep scrolling through my phone. So you've got to work out what are you doing instead of going to bed on time? What's the competing behavior? Then you've got to think about what reminds you to do that thing. So it's my hue. It's because I've got the phone there all the time. It's because now we don't even have to change the channel. It just scrolls on to the next episode, you know. So you've got to work out what's triggering me. Then you've got to work out how are you going to trigger yourself to do the new behavior? So you might say, we've got a tool called the, the daily diet exercise and sleep swap plan in, in the book. It's one of the habit mechanic tools. So you might say, I'm going to complete this habit mechanic um, sleep planning tool first thing every day. I'm going to set an alarm on my phone to remind me to do that. I'm going to stick it up on the fridge to remind me to do it. I'm going to get the kids to do it as well to remind me. So what are the triggers you're going to create to help you to do this? Then you've got to think, do I actually need some new knowledge and skills to help me to get better at sleep? Um, and if I do, where would I get those from? They're, again, they're all in the book. Um, every, everything I know about doing this is in this book, just to reiterate that. Um, so if it sounds a bit abstract, just read the book. Next one is, why do you want to build this habit? So activating the, the meaning behind it, connecting it to longer term goals. And again, we have a we have a tool, another ice theme tool, which is called the Fam Story Iceberg, the future ambitious meaningful story. So in fact, you've got the iceberg, then you've got the igloo, and then you've got the ice cube, and you've got some ice cubes and some ice sculptures in the productivity uh, piece, but it all connects together. Then you can think, who who can I get to help me to do this? So that's the social influence factor. So I might do it with my family. It's no good me trying to get to bed earlier if no one else in the house is trying to do it. So I might get them to buy into it. 
then you've got to think, what's the reward for doing this? I'll feel better tomorrow. I'll have better long-term brain health. I'll be more productive. I've got better chance of getting my promotion. And if you've got your goal, big goals mapped out, it's easier to think of it like that. Then also think about finally, what are the penalties if I don't get this right? Well, I'll feel worse tomorrow. I'll have poorer long-term brain health. I'll be less likely to get my promotion. I'll spend more time at work, less time at home with my family. So that's a very quick way of talking through the habit building plan. But by answering those questions, you are implicitly activating the nine action factors. So at the end of every chapter in the habit mechanic uh, skill section, we have an example habit building plan to show you how to create a habit in that, in that section. Well, what I found was interesting is that I've seen books that just cover habits or sleep or diet and exercise or motivation, but you've got everything all in the same book. Why did you write the book in this way? Was it just all your experience or how did this happen? They're all interconnected. And I, we wanted to create a complete program, a complete, for want of a better term, self-help program. If you want to get, if you want to be more productive, you're not going to do it unless you've got good sleep, diet and exercise habits, because that gets your brain working properly. You're not going to do it if you're overly stressed. You're not going to do it if you're not confident. All these things are interconnected. And if stress management doesn't feel important to you right now, I bet you at some point in your life it will. <clears throat> so you'll be able to come back to it. But this is a jigsaw puzzle. And the other approach that other books take is a bit like whack-a-mole. You know, you go, that's the problem, I'll do that. But then another problem springs up because you're not getting to the, the first uh, basic principles of neuro, of the neuroscience and the behavioral science. So we include all these areas because we found that this is what people struggle with. And they, you know, they might call motivation, personal drive, but it's the same thing. So we've, over the last 20 years, we've worked out what are the big challenges people are facing in their life? And how do you help people to overcome those challenges, which is ultimately about building better habits. And of course, as we said previously, if you want to be a great leader, if you want to be a, a great team power leader and go even further and be a great a chief habit mechanic, you can't do that unless you know how to be at your best. Um, so all our leadership training, <coughs> we have chief habit mechanic training programs. You know, it starts by helping people to become a better habit mechanic first so they can empathize and understand what their people are going through. And once you understand how to do that, you can then start using the cultural development tools and the team development tools. So it's all connected. Um, and that's why it's all in the, in the one book, because you could argue there's at least three books in there. But, but I didn't want to, I didn't want it to be a self I wanted it to be a complete package. And it's not something that you pick up and you read once and you put on your shelf and that's it. It's something you keep going back to. It's a manual for life. And it's designed so you don't have to read it cover to cover. You can just pick it up, open a random page, and you will learn something practical and insightful or go to the chapters that are most relevant for you. Um, yeah, so that, that all these ideas are interconnected ultimately. It's a jigsaw puzzle. All the pieces to the puzzle are in the book. All you need to do is read the book and start working out how to put them together in your life. And that will be a bit different for you than it will be for someone else. But you'll only work out how to do it by trying and testing things out. This is like doing a, a PhD on yourself, right. but not in a scary way, in a really practical way where you're learning about yourself. You're learning how to be a better version of yourself. You know, I'm, and I'm learning about myself all the time. And I know you are as well, Andrea. So we're developing our habit mechanic intelligence because again, the things that helped us to be at our best last week are probably not going to be the same things we need to help us to be at our best in two months' time because the world's changing so much. Right. That's what I loved about it, I think, was that I could see how I could start taking action and really close the gaps that you know they're there. We all know they're there. We know what they are, and they've just they've got to go. And you can clearly see as you start to do your activities. 
And there's just one thing, the difference between habit mechanic tools and chief habit mechanic tools. Just can you make sure that that I've got that right? I, I, I'm thinking it's work on myself first before I lead others. Is that it? Yeah, so habit mechanic tools are designed to help you to build better habits to be at your best. Using all the science, but in a simple, practical way. Chief habit mechanic tools are designed to help you help other people build better habits to help them be at their best using all the same core science. So if you want to become a chief habit mechanic, you first of all need to be a habit mechanic. So the chief habit mechanic piece is the, is the, the last part of the book. It's step four. And essentially you've got a range of tools that make it easier for you to help others to be at their best, which again is more complex post pandemic in the hybrid world of work than it was previously because most leaders got promoted to leadership positions because they were good at getting into a room with people bringing energy bringing influence you know and that's not happening very often anymore so we have to really um sharpen the behavioral science acts and the leadership science acts and learn how to build uh, new leadership habits and how to really harness behavioral science to help people to be at their best. Uh, and, and I think what sport science did, for example, for professional sport 20, 15 years ago, the performance improvements it made, I think we're going to see the same improvements uh, coming out of people using behavioral science and leadership science. Mm -hmm. But I don't know anywhere else that uh, describes them in such a practical way, like the habit mechanic approach, because I've read all those other books as well, <laughs> um, and I don't see it anywhere else. No, definitely. You caught my attention with Roger Bannister in the very beginning. And so if we were going to sum everything up, your life's work here, becoming a habit mechanic, what would you say to people listening? Like, you know, they've, they might be just looking at this thinking, well, I'd like to, to give this habit mechanic a shot. So they get the book. And there's, there's some work involved here. What else could you share with the services that you offer through um, your website as well to tie it all in? Yeah, I think start with the book. You know, the first chapter of the book is called The Daily Tea Plan, which is a two minute exercise that I, that's one of my super habits. I spend two minutes doing that every day and it saves me, I think it saves me hours every day. I think it's that powerful. So you don't have to read the book cover to cover to get something out of it. You'll get something out of it within five minutes of reading the first chapter. That's something you can use every day. And then the key is, is to set that time aside to work on yourself and learn how to become a better habit mechanic. We offer, you know, training to help people to do that as well. So we offer coaching, we offer cheap habit mechanic training. We offer team power training. We go all the way up to bespoke programs. Um, we, you know, that's in business, in sport and education. Um, you know, we do whole school programs, for example, in education. And just to bring back to the point, this is not just for adults, this is for everybody. And I, I think that if everybody became a better habit mechanic, the world would be a lot better place. You know, whatever your country is trying to achieve, it would be much easier for it to achieve those goals because we need to empower people to get better at managing, them, managing themselves in a world where it's becoming more and more difficult to manage yourself. And you're in this learning war where everyone's trying to hijack your attention. We need to be more and more sophisticated in helping ourselves to pay attention to the things that are most helpful for us, whether we are a um, elementary school, primary school child or whether we are you know CEO or manager of a, of a Premier League soccer team so these are these are essential life skills that no one really teaches us in a very formal way and I think that's what's different about the having mechanic approach it's a science-based formal way of learning about how to be your best um, for me it's that's the foundation for anything you're trying to achieve in your life whether it's a be a better parent be a great student, you know, be a great athlete, be a great manager and leader, be a great business owner. It's going to be much easier to do those things if you've got these foundational skills in place. 
Well, Dr. Finn, I want to thank you so much for coming on this podcast and sharing your tools, resources, strategies, really your life's work here in Habit Mechanics, teaching us all how to supercharge how we live, work, and lead. For people who want to learn more about your book, is the best place to go tougherminds.co.uk? Is that the best place? Yes, or just search on Amazon, The Habit Mechanic, and you'll find it on there. Got it. So I'll put all the links for people to follow you, the links to go to Amazon. And uh, I'm excited to see as new science comes out, what new strategies uh, that you'll also create that will accompany this, because I know this is just the start for you, right? Yes, we're refining all the time. Um, Yeah, which is exciting. So, but I think, I think now we do have a very good gist of how the brain works and what influences our behavior. It's about applying that knowledge and using it to help people to build better habits. So I think the next phase is making it easier for people to implement. And one of the things we've got coming very soon is our app. Um, It's called Habit Mechanic University, which in its most basic sense is just like a campus, essentially social media strand where you go on there and you post your daily tea plan and you support other people. So we're activating, you know, some of those uh, nine action factors. So that's what we're focusing our energies on. So how do you make it easy for people to implement these ideas? Got it. I put my name in to be on the waiting list for that. So I'll put the link in as well, if you want to uh, be on the waiting list to learn about when the app is ready, because I do like to stay up to date with what's new out there for implementing these ideas, because you really made me have a look at everything I'm doing to fine tune. So thank you so much, Dr. Finn. No, thank you, Andrew. And thank you to everyone who's listening.